All right, we're recording. Uh, this is Glenn Lowry with The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. Uh, I'm also at Brown University, and The Glenn Show is sponsored at Brown by the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And I am here with three gentlemen of Baltimore City. Uh, that is Mr. C sitting in the middle, and that is um, Alex on the left, and that's Walker on the right. And they have kindly agreed to join me to talk about their work uh, out of the Rose Street Community Center in Baltimore, uh, dealing with uh, the community struggle with the issue of violence and other things uh, ongoing there, which is a subject that has been discussed here at the Glenn Show off and on over the years. Um, we were just talking about theory and about righteousness, and I, I actually thought that that was pretty interesting. I asked Mr. C uh, what he hoped to achieve in this conversation that we're having here about Baltimore City, about violence, and uh, I'll mention in more detail in a moment about uh, the documentary film that's been made about their work at the Rose Street Community Center, a film called Charm City, which I'll introduce more fully in a moment. But we're just talking about that, uh, and uh, Mr. C was pointing out, Riley, that uh, I'm a theoretician, I'm an academic, I'm an uh, ivory tower, uh, and uh, he's somebody who's working on the ground in a city that faces a lot of difficult issues. Uh, and the question about how those two things connect to each other, Mr. C formalized that. I'd, I'd like to ask you to to review that as uh, I'm an economist doing theory, and he is a man in the city doing righteousness. I mean, can can you explain that, man? Well, <laughs> the roots where we are, we go we deep into the soil, deep into the soil. Now the soil, the soil. Uh, the layer that we're at is where you gotta you gotta have some uh, some tough hands because you don't you don't have a shovel so you gotta get, actually get down on your hands and knees and you gotta dig deep you gotta dig beyond uh, all the misconceptions of who you are you gotta dig uh, deeper beyond the angry black man syndrome because I might say something that you don't like you gotta dig beyond you know, that our community is full of drug dealers and hustlers. Uh, you got to dig beyond that uh, all the boarded up houses and all the ills of our community. You got to go to that part of the soil, right? You got to go there and plant something that's going to grow. And that's where we at this table at. We're, that, we're in that part of the soil so deep that when we plant something, it grows. Like my son here, he can tell you about the, the boxing uh, uh a uh, the boxing, he can tell you more about that, how it's growing. He planted that seed. And my son here can tell you, you deal with youth, okay, they can speak for themselves. But see, they're at that part of the soil where when you do something, it'll grow. But here's the thing. You got to add some water to it. Now, that's where you come in as a theorist. See, the theorists take what we say and explain it to the world. The academia. That's what you're good at. So that's what makes us partners. That you're able to take what we say and make it understandable to the John Hopkins world. Make it understandable to the Howards. Those, uh, what's it called? Black. The HBUs. Yeah, the HBUs. You know, those people. Okay. Which is also our kin people. You explain it to them where they would say, wow. We need to go out in the community, right, and find some real people that's digging deep into that soil. And look at the hands. You can look at the hands. The hands are dirty. Hands are dirty. Might have been through drug addiction. Might have been locked up. Uh, might, I mean, you name it. But see, if you just stop there, then you're not going deep enough. So as a theorist, right, we want you to listen to us very well and explain it to your listening audience exactly what's happening here. But if you come up wrong, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I expect to hear from you. <laughs> I do expect to be corrected. Okay, let, let me just add a little yes, something sir. to that. I uh, appreciate your perspective, Mr. C. Uh, the difference between theory and uh, practice on the streets. You say digging deep and you got to add water and uh, you could, something's going to happen that's good, but only if you get your hands dirty. Uh, now, I just want to say this. Uh, I am a recovering drug addict. Uh, 
I don't know if you knew that about me. Uh, back in the crack know that. years with crack cocaine was, you know, killing a whole bunch of folk back in the late 1980s. I was out there. I was a Harvard professor, yes, Harvard professor sneaking out of my office and going around the corner to these Dominican guys that were selling me the stuff. And I was cooking it up and I was smoking it and I couldn't stop doing it. And it almost killed me. And a couple of things happened, and I'm just telling you this so we can be on, you know, equal footing. I want to hear this. When we talk about a couple of things happened. One of them is I found Jesus, was baptized at the age of 40 in 1989 for the first time in my life. And the other thing that happened was uh, that I got myself into a halfway house, and I lived there for six months. Riding my bicycle from the halfway house in uh, South Boston up to Harvard University so I could still get my paycheck. Uh, The guy running the halfway house wouldn't let me have a car. He said, no, you don't need no car. All you're going to do with a car is get into trouble. What you need to do is stay focused on your program and get your butt over to your meetings at night and to your job in the morning. The bicycle is good enough for that. I lived in that halfway house for six months. I stopped using cocaine and I haven't used it since. My marriage survived and my son who's 30 years old now. Uh, was born uh, to a father who was clean and sober for the first time, really, in his life. That's me. Uh, So I'm not going to say I know a whole lot about the streets, but it's not like I don't know anything whatsoever about the streets. I know a little something. something. Anyway, I want to talk about you, and I want to talk about this film. You guys uh, are here at the Glenn Show because of the... um, role that you played in this uh, wonderful documentary film about Baltimore called Charm City. Uh, Charm City, I want everyone to know, is going to premiere on Independent Lens on Monday, the 22nd of April at 10 p.m. You should check your local listings to find out uh, the exact how to find it. But Charm City is uh, at PBS. Uh, it's also going to be simultaneously uh, uh, streamed online at pbs.org. And that's starting on Monday, the 22nd, 10 p.m. Charm City is a uh, exploration of uh, the work that you guys are doing uh, at the Rose Street Community Center and also of the role that the police officers are playing in trying to deal with the problem of uh, violence, the serious problem of violence in Baltimore. Uh, And I happened to view a, a preview of the film and was deeply moved uh, by it and was therefore very grateful when one of the producers contacted me and told me that uh, you might be available to uh, to talk. Uh, Charm City uh, is a deep dive, in-depth look uh, at the police community relations in Baltimore, at the problem of homicidal violence that's going on with the guys with guns shooting each other, and at the reaction, the positive and constructive reaction that some people, that is you, uh, are engaged in in response to this problem of through the Rose Street Community Center, uh, where I gather, Mr. C, that you are the director, and I gather, uh, 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 Alex and Walker, that you guys are, are uh, affiliates uh, involved in that work. So uh, I was uh, just setting up the conversation that we're having right now by describing the film and uh, where people can see it when it's finally going to be uh, broadcast. Um, and then wanted to return to talking with you guys about the work that you're doing there. And so I was asking you, uh, the last thing I said was uh, whether or not you would uh, want to describe briefly exactly what the Rose Street Community Center is about. Anybody want to take that one? Well, well uh, okay, Walker. Yeah. Uh, Rose Street Community Center uh Number one is a living organism. Living organism. That's right. It's alive. Uh, uh, We talked about change. In that film, also, uh, uh, my son's actual funeral was actually in that film as well. And and going through that process of suffering, you know, uh, and just navigating through my emotions, uh, and of course, uh, what actually helped me uh, get through that process, not only the support, but my relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, that uh, My relationship with my creator was critical. But the second critical aspect is that uh, 
in spite of my son becoming a homicide victim and actually dealing with his funeral, it was critical that the rest of my sons and my nephews uh, uh, and, and, and our community as a whole understand because the young people are becoming uh, victims of homicide. And I had to reach out and press through that process to uh, let the young people, the young generation know that, look, uh, uh, yeah, my son is here. I don't want you to fall in the same category as what I have to navigate through through this process. And again, I'm grateful because uh, the support, the support of the family, the Rose Street family, uh, 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 and also sharing a collaborative vision, knowing that work need to get need to be done, and that in that that particular situation, I had to let the rest of the young people know, uh, uh, the, the the young men and women in our community know that look, gotta be able to fight through the barriers and get that that that, that root. Uh, that was just mentioned. Uh, that was a that was a part of uh, the imagery of it of breaking through that process, reaching, still reaching out, young people, in spite of, let them know, look, your life is just equally as valuable as uh, even though it's my 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 firstborn. But they had to let them know that we're we're all family, and that it is critical and it's important that they live and they understand that. Uh, 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 that no matter what, right, that we have to uh, dispense love, care, and consideration uh, to the heart of our, our community as a whole. And then, of course, uh, one of the greater priorities also, uh, when we talk about the community, we deal with our children, our elders, and our community as a whole, but in particularly dealing with the homicides in our community, our young pe- people are losing their lives at an alarming rate. So even though uh, uh, that was a difficult process, but it was a process that was needed to reach those who could potentially uh, become homicide victims, but yet let them know that uh, uh, that opportunity exists, that uh, uh, the true element of it takes a village to raise a family exists, uh, to let them know that uh, uh, you're seeing living practitioners and to see that imagery that exists in our community, uh, we ha- it has to come alive. And that living organism that I was just speaking about is being practitioners. Because that's exactly what we have to do. We have to live it. This is not about talk. We're in a state of urgency. uh, And we got to do everything in our power in a righteous way to make uh, things happen uh, so that we can uh, uh, improve and we can grow those seeds and that water and that increase that we're talking about is being practitioners in the heart of our community so that we can make things uh, better. If I could just piggyback. Oh, yeah, please, Alex, go ahead. You know, Rose Street Community Center is really the main artery of East Baltimore and Baltimore as a whole. Um, the number one message that we really deliver to everyone we contact and, and, and get in reach with is unity and, and really getting back to the sense of family. Um, and I think this would really separate Rose Street from a lot of other community centers. It's more than just what we can do for you. It, it, it's really about reaching the person and the individual and, and, and trying to figure out ways to make your life and everybody around you life better. When they talk about um, placing the seed, Mr. C has been great at this um, for years, about 20 plus years. Hundreds of young men that came out of Baltimore filled with all type of talent and potential that never really believed in themselves. You know, um, and it's not saying anything other than when you come from the dark. It, it, it's very hard to see that light. And Mr. C, he constantly shine a light on you to let you know what you have to offer to the world, not only to make your life, say your life better, but then the people around you lives. Um, like you say, I started a boxing program that I started in my basement. And for months, we never really took any real interest in thinking that it was an actual program or anything like that. We was really just having fun with the kids, letting them come together and do what they want. And, you know, every day, Mr. C would tell me, son, that's a program. 
son, that's a program. And before I knew it, I sat down with him, put some things on paper, and I can actually say that I'm an OSI, you know, award winner in 2017. I received Sorry, I my fellowship. Excuse me for interrupting. What is OSR? Open Society Institute. Aha. George Soros. George yeah, Soros. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know about him. Yeah, I, I can definitely say. Uh, Congratulations. I say Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, and that's a huge, huge honor um, worldwide. And like I said, he, he shined that light on me to, to make me realize what I was actually doing and how it actually benefited, you know, the people around me. Um, like what I say, we both suffered losses um, through the process of this film. I lost my sister. Um, I lost my mom and, and, and countless other friends. Yes. And, and, and cool, like so, so things been been kind of real for us out here. Like they were saying, like we 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 live in the streets. So Road Street constantly reflect the light on the people in their community, so they don't never give up hope. And I think that's the most vital thing, you know, to to always remember is that our kids is losing hope at an all time high, you know. So as long as we can install the idea that it's going to get better. That sparks the change, you know. So this film, people like you, Mister Seal, I say, yeah, this is what what get us going, you know. So we just gotta keep at it and and, and make the light shine even bigger. Cause that's the only thing that we face in our communities. Like I say, it's not enough light. Okay, it's good to hear you. It's better to know that you're doing what you're doing because. Uh, Without that kind of uh, effort, I don't know where the hope was going to come from. And that's what I want to ask you about. I want to ask you about politicians. Okay? Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you about public policy. I want, I want to ask you about the police, the government, because there's all this talk, all this argument. You see it all the time. Uh, people on TV going back and forth, the conservatives and the liberals. Everybody's got their idea about how to fix these problems. Uh, people uh, talking about white supremacy and white racism, talking about racist cops, uh, talking about there aren't any jobs. Then you got other people talking about personal responsibility, talking about black folk need to clean up their act and stop being so violent and stuff like that. And I'm just asking where you all, not that you all have the same idea, you three different individuals, but where you, and I'm happy to hear from anybody, see the work that you're doing fitting within to the larger political conversation. Is anybody getting up in front of a microphone or going on television saying stuff that you think is relevant to solving the problems that you're talking about? Uh, are there any programs that you feel would be especially helpful in your effort to try to instill hope in a more positive outlook uh, toward the young people that you be uh, that you be interacting with? Um, I could go on in that vein. What about uh, gun control? What about jobs programs? Uh, you know, is, is, is cooperation with the police a bad thing or a good thing in your neighborhood, this kind of thing? You see what I'm getting at? Definitely. Yeah, that's exactly where you're going. Okay. Everything that you just said, right, there is a percentage of our community that can be described by all those concepts you just put out there. But not just our community, Every community in America has a percentage that will fit into all those categories that you put out there. Now, here's something that's real important when you're talking about the big picture. People in the big picture, they like to describe us as dysfunctional. Uh, look at him. He got his pants down. He, uh, he don't speak good English. You know, he speak, uh, I don't even know if they use the word Ebonics. Yeah, they use it. Uh, he didn't graduate from high school. Okay. They try to put as many labels as they can on one person. Then when they can, they can put a lot of labels on one person, then that uh, community starts looking at them in a demon sense. In other words, you just demonize somebody. Now, when you demonize me, I have to uh, think about uh, 
am I uh, uh, living in a dysfunctional environment? I got to give I got to give it a name too. Okay, so I said, okay, I'm gonna start at a point of dysfunction. But guess what? Being in that point, that's a starting point. That means that we got something to work on. We got something to work on. So don't be embarrassed to tell your story that you used to use drugs because that's going to help somebody. You was dysfunctional at that time. Don't, don't be ashamed to tell your story that uh, you was a bank robber because you was dysfunctional at that time. Whatever it is, don't be ashamed to tell your story. Tell your story, but when you tell your story, be able to add a, 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 a certain amount of hope in there. Now, if you don't have any hope in your story, then I suggest you keep your dysfunctional story to yourself because now you're also being labeled by the community. You'll be, okay. you'll be labeled as a uh, 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 a lot of words, and, you know. I use a couple of them because you're a conservative. You, you, you know some of these words. You can be labeled as a uh, Uncle Tom, uh, even though you know you might not know what the real Uncle Tom is. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, you can be labeled as a snitch. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a whole lot of labels that can go with you. All right. So. Because we're starting from a, dis- a dysfunctional point. We have to find the middle road where you can grow into what? A healthy individual with respect, dignity, uh, a, re- uh, a, re- a resourceful father and not a deadbeat father, uh, uh, someone that treats the women like they're supposed to be treated. Uh, treat the LGBTQ community like they're supposed to be treated, uh, the children like they're supposed to be treated. But you you don't start off that. See, in that dysfunction, right? When you look at me, okay, you might see a nigga. But that's okay. Because if you see a nigga when you look at me, right, then you're just, you're more dysfunctional than I am. And that's okay. Because, see, if I know where you are, then I can help you. Yeah. Come on in, okay, to understand it, right? Where now, okay, we family. We family now. So you can say, look, you know what, Mr. C? You look like a nigga to me. Okay? And you know what I say to you? You don't even know what a nigga is. Okay? Because a lot of people, when they look at me, they say something like this. That's an angry black man. Okay? Why am I an angry black man? I'm an angry black man because I don't want John Hopkins to conduct studies in my community where they take advantage of those that's in the opioid crisis. And when you recruit them, you put a few dollars in their pocket, then there's no treatment plan. You let them go back to the streets. Yeah. But when I sue you, which I am in the process, me and my son is in the process of suing John Hopkins right now because before they conduct studies in our community, we want public hearings because we already talked to someone that live in another community, right, across the tracks, if you will, and they said John Hopkins wouldn't dare do that in their community because if they did, they would have to have a public hearing. But they come to me because I'm unemployed, I'm already in an opioid crisis. And they say, check this out. Come on in here and get these drugs. And for the life of me, what I don't understand is why our police commissioner won't go and arrest those people. So I'm angry with black man because I say, hey, commissioner, go and arrest that John Hopkins guy that's conducting that study because guess what? He just uh, uh, invited my community in to get some cocaine. He just invited them in, right? To smoke some marijuana. You just invited a man, right? To use some heroin. You just invited a man, right? To use some fentanyl. But if I do that on the street, right? Then you're going to take me to jail. So let me just be clear, uh, since you're talking about this, uh, some research team at Hopkins 
wanting to examine drug use patterns, recruiting participants in their study from East Baltimore, and uh, in so doing, contributing to the uh, drug use crisis in the city? I mean, I'm, I'm, you, you object. Yeah, 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 you just said it. I'm okay. glad you're going on the path. No, you just said it. Whenever they recruit, people come in, because they might offer like six or $700. That's a lot to somebody that's in the act of addiction. Now you're getting your drugs free because they are conducting a study. I see. And you can check this out before you air this. Now, after the study is complete, you let me loose. You haven't done anything to me yeah, I see. to bring me out of the act of addiction. You haven't okay. offered me lifetime counseling. Uh, you haven't uh, uh, helped me uh, to go. You haven't, the resources that you gave me, if any, right, is so minimum that I say, you know what, I'm going to stay in my act of addiction. And that's what's going on right now in Baltimore City in our neighborhoods. And we cannot get a public hearing to say to John Hopkins, check this out. Community, uh, dealing with the approval process. Community have to be a part of that decision-making process because the community can say, listen, we don't want that research done on the community. So we don't have a chance or an opportunity to even <laughs> give our voice or advice. We're not guinea pigs. No. no we're, we're, we're your political representatives who it seems to me should be the people interceding with an institution like Johns Hopkins to make sure that the dignity of his or her constituents is being respected. Who well, our political leaders are. And, well, yeah, where, where's your state rep or whatever? Well, some of them on the way with, to the bank with a check from John Hopkins. Some of them used to work for John Hopkins. Some of them have family, family members, right, that are employees with John Hopkins. So where are they? I just told you. Mm-hmm. And they need an investigation about that, just like they're investigating our mayor right now. There needs to be a further investigation. And John Hopkins just got their own police force. Own police force. Now, the police uh, force that we got in Baltimore City, right? How come you didn't go to the new commissioner and say to him, let's sit down and let's work together? No. Here's what you said. Y'all too corrupt. So we're going to go to Annapolis, the lawmakers, and we're going to get our own police force because we don't trust Baltimore City police force. What kind of message is John Hopkins sending to the country about Baltimore City Police Department that is that corrupt? Yes, we had a police that right now they can't figure out uh, uh, how did he die in the alley. They still trying to figure out whether he killed himself or no police killed him, uh, whoever. Okay? But if you really think that John Hopkins police for now let me stop right there. Matter of fact, if you Google the police department that John Hopkins has just put in place, in the uh, subject, in the bill, you wouldn't even know that it's a police department. That's how shrewd they was in, commu- in using community language to hide behind so that they could create a police force at John Hopkins. And you know what's even more Okay, I'm going to let you go in a minute. I'm going to let you talk. All right, go ahead. You got it. Okay, I just got to make this last point, right? right. And I know you might cut this out. (laughs) The The most powerful Congress in America, okay, and I voted for him, and I'll vote for him again. Elijah Cummins, the one that's talking about the the, the Trump, and rightfully so, he should be talking about Trump. But he went to Annapolis, right? And you need to check this out. You know what he said to them? I'm begging you to give John Hopkins a police force. Now, here's a powerful congressman who I'm going to vote for again, but the language that he used, you haven't even begged for the community to get resources. You haven't even begged for the juvenile detention center to get resources. But yet you're going to beg for John Hopkins to get a police force? Come on now. And I'm going to vote for him again because he's a man. But right when he did that, though, oh, that was a big mistake. Well, all politicians are entitled to one. Unfortunately, our mayor made several thousand. But I still got a lot of respect for her, too. Okay? But he just made one big one. 
And I'm going to excuse him from that. But if you make another one, I'm going to put my vote somewhere else. All right. Congressman Cummings is on notice. <laughs> Listen, uh, <laughs> what role are the cops, the Baltimore City Police Force, playing in uh, East Baltimore and in the uh, Rose Street community uh, area in terms of trying to stem the tide of violence? Are they are they uh, helpful? Are y'all? What do y'all think about the? Got the a story for you. Yeah, go ahead. Got a story for you right now. There's a rapper cop called himself the Saint. And his last name is Jackson. And we've been trying to get a hold to him for a week to come and talk and rap to our young people on Saturday. And he's in the Central District, if you're listening, Saint. Okay? And guess what? Uh, we can't get him. We can't get him. You mean he won't, they you mean respond to your call? Huh? He won't answer you? I mean, what do you mean you can't get him? He, he won't? Uh... No, he won't. He won't answer us. We can't get him. Maybe you can get him after this, right? His name is uh, uh, Jackson. I didn't mean Johnson. That's Jackson. Jackson is his last name, and he's in the Central District in Baltimore City, and he's a rapper, and he calls himself the Saint. And we can't get him to come give a rap to our youth. Have y'all tried to get him yet? No. Okay, well, I'm here to tell you, right? It's going to be very difficult. <laughs> I don't know why. So you're talking about police community relationships. Yeah. Why do we have to, in a sense, right, plead with the police department to interact with our community? Well, guess what? They got this concept where they're locking us up in the morning and they let us go at night. The commissioners say, okay, if they got some recreational weed, lock them up and the state's attorney say, let them go. Our state commissioner, no, our state attorney and our commissioner in Baltimore City, police commissioner, right? They can't even communicate. And these are two powerful law enforcement agencies. So if they can't even agree and communicate with each other, what do you expect us on the street to do? That's where we're at right now. Let, let me ask. All those cities a ball of confusion. I, I want to ask a, yeah, another question. It might be it might be a little uncomfortable, but I, I feel like I need to ask it. Well, Alex ask lost, it. Alex like lost his sister. Alex lost his sister to the violence. Walker lost his son. I, you have my condolences. I'm very sorry for your loss to the violence. So you all know firsthand about burying people who've been killed, your loved ones who've been killed on the streets of Baltimore. Do you also know about who people? Pardon? No, what were you saying? What kind of people? No, I, I said you all know from firsthand experience what it means to be burying somebody that you loved who was killed by people on the streets of Baltimore. That's what I said. I'm basing that on what Walker has said and what Alex has said. Talking talking about firsthand, about. Experience. firsthand experience. That's what I'm talking about. And now I'm trying to ask you something. Does it go in the other direction? Do you also know firsthand people? who have committed homicide, and are you mad at them? Well, you said something about uh, 20 minutes ago, and I hope you haven't forgot it. You said, look, you was 40 years old when you found Jesus. That's right. Okay, then. Well, uh, I found Jesus. I let him go, and I found him again. All right? Now, I'm saying all that to say, right, uh, when I let him go, if somebody didn't say something to me and involve themselves in my life in a way that will help me think about uh, letting this play out a different way, right, then I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. So somebody had to reach out to me. Okay. Somebody had to reach out to me. And to me. Okay. And to you. Yeah. All right. And Jesus led them to me. I truly believe that. Now, I'm going to back up because it's first hand. Okay. Uh, personally speaking, if you live in any city, I'm pretty sure you could say you know one person that then committed a homicide or attempted a homicide. Um. But once again, these 
are the situations that we face when we pit it against each other. That's right. We live in a time where there's no such thing as strange and danger. Um, we just lost somebody that almost everybody all over the world considered to be a great individual um, and a young brother, Nipsey Hussle. Mm -hmm. And he was gunned down by a friend, somebody that he bent over backwards for and did everything possible to try to get him on the right path. Unfortunately, when things like this happen, the outrage that the community feels, right or wrong, you see things play out. Um, and I say that me personally, when my sister was killed, she was killed by, once again, a, a friend, somebody that she, she took care of, she, she let in her house, let stay with her so on and so forth. So the tensions was high. Expectations was high, you know? And if it wasn't for me really sitting back and, and knowing that I was entrapping myself, I can't say what I would have done. You know, and I should sit here being 100% honest. If, if I knew 100% that the police wasn't watching me, if I knew that I wasn't being, you know, followed and so on, if I haven't literally had officers come up and, and, and drop hints at where this guy might be, so, so that let me know that it was a trap. It, it's no telling what I may have done. Hold, hold on, hold on. Excuse me for interrupting. If I understand you, you're saying the police or some police officer tried to give you information that might have led you to seek revenge as a, so as to entrap you into committing an act of violence that they could then come back on you about. Is that what you say? Several times. I would be outside in the morning cleaning up. I, I would have dude, I mean, I mean, cops pull up to me in gang squad time. Oh, yeah. You sure your sister ain't get killed because she had blood? You sure she ain't get killed because she had crip? Oh, you know Lil Yo be here. And like, like all types of, like I say, mm -hmm. that let me know that it's way deeper than me. It's way deeper than my family. And they go back to the root of why we are where we at, like I say, pitted against each other. So you in a lose-lose situation, you damn if you is or you damn if you don't. You know, so we don't sit back and try to judge people because we know it's very easy to find yourself in any situation. That's in front of the gun or behind the gun. That's in front of the pipe. Or, you know what I'm saying? So all these things is situational. If somebody raped your mother, the chances of me being able to tell you let that slide is next to none. That's something that you and God got to work on. You know, so too many times, we try to be God and tell people how they should react to situations that us ourselves wouldn't react to like that. You know, and it, and it go back to the, the, the placement of labels. And, and I tell people this all the time. It, it's crazy how the number one claim for a safer world is gun control. But last time I checked, 90% of the guns in this world are uh, owned by people that legally can have them. Majority of the guns that's used to commit homicides in inner cities have all been confiscated several times before. <laughs> so how did a gun that was confiscated in 85 end back on the streets to kill somebody in 2018? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. hit it against each other. So we tired of really, we, we know what the game is. We know the hustle. And like I say, we find ways to connect with our brothers and our sisters to show them don't fall for the trap because everybody's sitting back getting rich. Everybody's sitting back securing their future off your downfall. They start a billion corporations off the struggle of black people and then sit back and tell you what you shouldn't do. Take some of that money you just made off my back and invest back into my community and then tell me something. Everybody just stripped down to the bare bone and then say, look at the skeleton. You know, so we don't look for a community 
policing because we are the co community policing. Right. We don't look for politicians because we are the politicians. Anything that has to happen in our neighborhood, we can do. Right. They need when these politicians come down, they they begging for us to keep them in their position. Yeah. When they show face, it ain't because they care about nobody. It's because they want to keep that check that they've been getting for the past couple years, and they know this is the part that they got to play. So we're not puppets. You won't use us to get where you want to be. We're going to make sure we get to where we need to be. I, I wanted to ask you how you relate to the Crips and the Bloods. I mean, that's uh, your term. I'm talking about the gangs. I'm talking about, you know, community organized, socially connected, criminally conspiring, revenge seeking, uh, you know, groups of uh, young men and women, I suppose, who are uh, out there doing the stuff that they're doing. Uh, do you know who they are? Uh, do they have respect for you? Uh, can you have influence over them? Do you bring some of their people into your own organization? Right. You're definitely getting putting on your conservative hat right now. Let's go back to the question before this one. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Dealing with uh, uh, how, you know, the response. How do we respond to grief? I think that was more. Yeah, that was, and, and are you mad at the people who did it? That, that was what okay. I was asking. Well, yeah. okay. Well, let me say this to you, right? Okay. It's natural to be mad when somebody takes your loved one. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now a mature adult handle their madness in a way that it's not even uh, uh, classified as madness. If I lose one of my family members to the street, okay, and you say I'm mad, you automatically then push me uh, to think a certain way. No, I'm not mad. I'm upset. I'm upset. And now, if I understand I'm upset because I lost a loved one, then there's an opportunity for me to do something with it. Like when other communities, when they go in there and, and, and shoot up the school, okay? Yeah. All right. Well, they're angry. But you'll never hear it on the 6 o'clock news, what you just said. And that's where your conservatism came out. You said mad. You know why? Because I'm black. But if I wasn't black, okay, you would have said, you would have used a more gentler word. So you know exactly what you're doing right now, okay? But see, because me and you are about the same age, right? We are. See, I'm right. <laughs> okay? He was upset when he lost his sister. And he was upset when he lost his son. But mad, that's for dogs. Here, this is what I'm getting at. Never mind what yeah, word. What I, never mind the word, okay? Blood this, blood. this is what I'm getting at. Let me just say this. Okay. So so uh, if a uh, rogue cop pull out rogue? his gun. You say rogue, rogue, right? Rogue, R-O-G-U-E, rogue cop, bad cop. That has nothing to do with his color, though, right? Yeah, that's right. Nothing to do with his color. Pull okay. out his gun and shoot a kid running away unarmed in the back. The community yeah. is going to be up in arms. There's going to be people in the street. There's going to be a demand for justice. They're going to be mobbing in the courthouse, and they're going to want that cop's head on a platter because they're mad at the cop for killing that unarmed kid. And what I'm asking... You mad, but go ahead. Okay, but forget that word. I mean, I, let me use another well, word. Use upset. They're upset. They're upset. Okay. okay? But okay. I'm saying they are prepared to publicly express their upset and to demand that something be done with the killer. If he's a cop. And the question that I was asking with respect to people who are taking lives of your loved ones in your own community, on your own streets, who happen oh, yeah. perhaps to be residents of that very same community. Is yeah. there anything like the same feeling of upset uh, that uh, gets expressed vis-a-vis -vis the people who did that killer? Because if black, yes. lives, if black Lives Matter, all of them matter, not just the ones that okay. are okay. Okay, forget Black Lives Matter for a moment. Okay, all right, okay. All right, I knew you was right. going there. No, okay, no, no, black no, Lives Matter. I don't have to go there. I'm okay. asking you a direct right, right, right. Okay, okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? Okay. The media has a way. I'm not going to use the fake news like Trump say, but the media has a way of uh, 
encouraging us, if you will, to express our upsetness in a way that looks like we don't care about our loved ones when something happens. But well, here's what happened when something happened to our loved ones that you don't see. We get together and we sit down and we talk about it. Not only do we talk about it, we pray about it. Right. Okay? So, and the media is not there. So, therefore, the only picture that you see, right, is the one when the road cop shoots someone and we're out in the street. When someone had killed one of our loved ones, right, we don't need to be out in the street like that. We need to be around people that will help us process how we feel. So, and when there's people around that just love us and help us process how to go through the trauma that we just went through, here's what you get. Want me to tell you what you get? You want me to tell you? Yeah. You get a miracle. You get a miracle that's sitting here before you. That's what happens, right? When we get in small groups and we talk about our trauma to people that care about us, that's what we get. But now, if I'm paying my taxes to you and you done shot my son in the back running away, okay, and you done use my money to buy your gun, the lawyer. I got a problem with that. Your uniform, your police car, okay? Yeah, I got a problem with that, a big problem, because I don't want my money used that way. Okay, so that's when it comes to using my taxpayers' dollars. I know people think I don't pay taxes. Okay, they think all of us don't pay taxes. Okay, so that's why they look at us a little bit different. Well, matter of fact, when they look at us, right, they don't even think taxpayer a lot of times. You know, they don't even think about that. All right, but we pay more taxes in our community than probably you pay in yours. All right, that's right. I, I appreciate your response. Let me ask you, 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 uh, I remember seeing in Charm City, it struck me, it really did, Mr. C, where okay. you were, you gave a speech where you were trying to teach about snitching and about right. what snitching is. And you were trying to say, if I understood you, to the right. young people, look at, if you walking down and you got your brother or your wife right. or your son, and somebody That's come right. along and pop a cap in them and kill them, and you go That's to the right. cops, you're not snitching. That's not snitching. That's, That's love not. and self-respect. That's okay. right. Can you elaborate on that point? What What is snitching? What kind of cooperation with the police do you, uh, do you preach and teach is, uh, is a good thing and, and so forth? Well, thank you. Okay, well, see, now, you know, lost the question that I was going to get to about the bloods and crisps, but it's okay, because me and you the same age. Okay, now, If me and you rob a bank together and they sit down with me, they say, look here, Mr. C, you're going to get 40 years. Now, but if you tell on that guy that was with you, okay, we're going to cut your time in half, 20 years. And I say, well, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah, him, he had on blue, uh, he had on uh, uh, wingtips, uh, okay? Yeah. That's yeah. snitching. Okay. Because if you can't do the time. Don't do the crime. So that's snitching. But if you kill somebody I love and I see you do it, well, here's the thing, right? Sometime in our community, us being an eyewitness is not enough for the police. Our conviction rate is Baltimore City is probably lower than any other place, any other city in America, even with eyewitnesses. So we hesitate about that. So that's why you get okay. other kind of okay. ways to deal with us being upset in the community. Okay, now what about the Crips and the Bloods? I had asked, do you know these guys? Uh, do you, uh, how do you re re interact with them? And uh, do you try to get some of the people inside your organization and stuff like that? What did you want to say about that? Alex got it. Well, first of all, they are part of the community. And people tend to want to ostracize them and, 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 and cut them off. And that's why you usually find these be the individuals that are victimize you. Because you already don't have no respect for them and you didn't cut off every opportunity that they had at something to fail in life. So you become 
than something fed. We practice what we preach. We like I said, we know guys that made mistakes. But anytime an individual wants to better himself, how can you sit back, whoever you are, and tell them, oh nah, because of your past? Like I said, you 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 forcing them to continue to live in their past. You know, so we embrace every we uplift everybody because it's gonna take everybody. If you're a crip and there's something going on in your neighborhood. I can't come tell nobody that's a crip what to do because I ain't in that world. You know what I'm saying? Like, you will respect me as an individual and as a man, but at, at some point, politics are politics. So you're going to need somebody that's from that world to be able to go back to it and be like, look, we need to chill. We need to fall back, whatever the case may be. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't come down to no city and go on no block and tell nobody nothing about how they operate with everything you didn't accomplish in life. You know, so like I said, we, we we tend to forget who's the real community members. It's so much migrating and, <laughs> and, 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 and really castrating of these communities that everybody sit back and it, it, it's almost like living in California. You know, um, when, when you got million dollar homes all around you and you you coming from a Slauson, you 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 coming from a cop or something like that, your opportunity is that house. Not no school, not no job, but that house. Cause no matter what you do in life, you'll never be able, you know what I'm saying, in your mind to get what they already achieved. And because they continue to cut you off, they don't want to hire you. They're not going to give you no job to even be they gun or they trash man just to come around and straight you know what I'm saying. So guess what? When you, I know you on vacation. Me and my little homeboys, we gonna run up make your house because you got 80 inch TV. You got about four of them. You got every game system that's out. And me and my family and hood gonna be straight. All for you. I appreciate it. You know. So this, so this what happened time and time again when we alienate people. You know, so everybody want to talk about crime and, and this, that, and the third. It's force fed. Any community you go to in America, if they don't want crime to exist, guess what? It won't happen. Can I ask something? To Let go ahead. Let me share something. Yeah, yeah please. Um, but let's, 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 you know, we deal with affiliation. <laughs> affiliation right now, uh, let's deal with a, another uh, aspect to affiliation for a moment. Okay. Uh, when we deal with affiliation, you know, there's always the negative side of affiliation when it comes to uh, most, uh, we would deal with our community, but in particularly most black communities across the face of America. Now, there's another suit that we have in progress right now that's on the books. Right. And it's dealing with affiliation. Now, media, let's go back there for a moment. When you deal with the media, uh, for some reason, right, something can happen in Afghanistan. Uh, they can say uh, uh, 40 uh, Muslims just been killed. Uh, 35 Christians just been assassinated. But when you roll the sheet back into our community, right, they, 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 you know, so right now they're talking about uh, solutions, what could take place. Look how horrific this was. Uh, uh, what kind of ideas and, and uh, 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 solutions that we can come up with to help those and the families that are suffering in other countries outside of America? Let's come on back home for a moment. Now, in our community, uh, when it deals with affiliation, they always associate it with Bloods, Crips, BGF, uh, and then they, they, they will, so, but lately, I haven't really been listening to uh, uh, media, in particular, you know, WJZ or other uh, media speak about those actual uh, uh, affiliations as they were before, previously. Now, What's critical at this point is that uh, uh, through uh, also through uh, the media having uh, 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 consent from the family and having a relationship uh, with the community, it says, look, if your young man or your daughter, or whoever it is that becomes a homicide victim in Baltimore City, right, if their religious affiliation is actually given out to the community, maybe we can bring the Baptists to the street. Uh, maybe we can bring the Muslims to the street. Uh, maybe we can bring the seven day of Venice to the street. 
Because those aspects of affiliations, right, from a positive and a very therapeutic process is not being driven through the veins of the media so that we can understand the principle of uh, bringing more solutions to the streets. So uh, at this point, I think it's critical. Uh, when we deal with affiliation, whether it's Blood Crips, BGF, uh, that negative side, uh, the newspapers and the, and the media says, look, uh, look at all this negativity. But what we're asking them at this point right now, right, uh, now we're saying uh, uh, media, <laughs> in particular WJZ, right, uh, anytime there's a homicide that's committed in our city, we ask you to get permission from the family and to release their religious affiliation so we can actually bring from a community perspective that we can bring more solutions to the street by you announcing their religious affiliation. And then uh, 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 then we all can uh, come and join hands uh, on an equal uh, basis and premise. Okay, Walker, I appreciate it. Listen, I'm going to have to wrap this up. I'm going to have to wrap this up because we're running out of time. Uh, I've got okay, this Alex. this five seconds. Oh, uh, Miss C, you want to say something? Go ahead. I, let me hold on. Just let me wrap this up, and then I can give you the last word. Have you ever seen a white blood? Have you ever seen a white crip? In I've the media? never seen. I have never in the media. Do they exist? Are there some white people in these gangs? Plenty of them. <laughs> okay. No, I have never seen. That's them. my that's last me. word. All right, that's that's good enough. We got Asian crips. <laughs> <blood. laughs> that's, right. that's just us. <laughs> all right, all right. I got Alex. I got Mr. C. I got Walker. Uh, they're from the Rose Street Community Center and from East Baltimore. They've been kind enough to come in and express themselves, I think, very eloquently and forcefully on their perspective on what's going on in their community and what's going on in this country. I'm Glenn Lowry at The Glenn Show, and all I can do is say thank you to my guests for coming on. Uh, remind you that Charm City, the documentary film that uh, depicts the work of the Rose Street Community Center, is going to air uh, for the first time on PBS, 10 p.m. on Monday, April 22nd. So thanks to you guys for coming in and giving me some of your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to stop the tape.